So what if you could tattoo your next smartwatch directly on your skin? So this idea of merging man and machine is not new. Uh, some of you may remember a 70s show called The Bionic Woman, uh, or, something more <laughs> or, or something more recent, such as this. So this is a Boston Dynamics robot, which is designed to move and behave and walk uh, more and more like a human. But what if you could also tackle the inverse problem and make humans more and more like robots? So this may sound like science fiction, but in fact, there are cyborgs among us today, perhaps even in the audience here. Uh, people who, for example, have lost the ability to hear completely, and so they have a cochlear implant installed on their ear and their head in order to restore the ability to hear. Or people who have pacemakers implanted to regulate their heartbeat. Or someone may be an amputee and have a prosthetic uh, limb attached in order to help them walk again. So if you can attach devices on the body in order to regenerate and restore and reverse impairments, then you can also attach devices on the body that can augment as well. And so this may sound, again, like science fiction, but how many of you wear a smartwatch? So you have the entire world's information on your wrist. So essentially, you are bionic. <laughs> the only thing about this, though, is that this is essentially a brick that's tethered to your wrist. It's not a true seamless merger of the device with the skin. So why is this a challenge? How do we actually take this device and merge it in a seamless way with the body? Well, there's really two main challenges that need to be overcome in order to accomplish this. The first is the fact that this device is hard, rigid, and brittle, whereas your skin is soft, flexible, and stretchable. So there's a mechanical discrepancy between the two. And it's not just the glass in the device or the metal. It's really the silicon semiconductor that powers the device, which is the hard, rigid, brittle element that can't be merged onto the skin. The second thing is that these devices are flat. They're two-dimensional, they're planar, whereas your body is three-dimensional. And so there's, in addition to the mechanical mismatch, there's a dimensionality mismatch between these two paradigms. So I'm a mechanical engineering professor at the University of Minnesota, and what my team works on is trying to overcome these challenges and find a way to seamlessly merge this device onto the skin and be able to tattoo your next smartwatch directly on your skin. So how do we do that? Well, enter this technology called 3D printing, which I think by now probably most of you have heard of. Now, believe it or not, the 3D printing technology was developed by Scott Crump, who's the founder of Stratasys right here in Minnesota. So 3D printing has roots here in Minnesota. And basically, the way it works now, this is a conventional 3D printer, is that you have a plastic filament, which is fed into the printer, and then it's melted, extruded through a nozzle, and then solidifies onto a base uh, beneath it. So it solidifies into a hard plastic, and this stage can move in three-dimensional space. It can move left, right, up, and down in order to create an intricate object like the one you see here in a layer-by-layer -layer process, where the design of this object was originally designed in a computer program, and that comp computer commands the printer to actually print this object out layer-by-layer -layer by melting plastic, extruding it, and solidifying into the hard plastic object you see here. So this is an amazing technology. It can do, make beautiful devices like the one you see here, but the problem is hard plastic has limited utility. First of all, it's not functional, it's just a hard plastic. Second of all, the hard plastic is much harder, let's say, than your skin, and so it can't really be seamlessly merged with the body even though it's three-dimensional. So what we, want to move, what we want to do is we want to move from this paradigm of printing hard plastics toward printing functional materials. And that's what our team at the University of Minnesota does. So we build our own 3D printers. We engineer them from the bottom up in order to do this. Now, this printer actually looks similar to the one that you saw on the previous slide in the sense that there's a stage that moves in three-dimensional space, and there's nozzles which extrude material. But instead of extruding plastic, what we're doing is we're extruding inks. And these inks can be biological inks, so they can contain cells. The inks can be particle-based inks. They can contain conductive and semiconductive particles or nanoparticles. 
the inks can be ultra soft materials like silicones that are as soft as the skin and much softer than the hard plastics you saw on the previous slide. And the beautiful thing about this approach is you can interweave these three categories of materials all together on the same platform, uh, which is just sitting out in air. So what this printer allows us to do is overcome many of the challenges that I described before when I was talking about the smartwatch. The first being that now we can print in three-dimensional space. So we can print in a geometry that's naturally conformal to the three-dimensional body. The second thing is now we can merge very soft materials, as soft as the skin, with functional materials like conductive and semiconductive materials all together on the same platform, and maybe even biological materials as well, in order to create a hybrid, multifunctional structure that's uh, multidimensional and can conform to the body. So we've overcome the mechanical discrepancies from before, and we've overcome the dimensionality challenges that we described before. A good example of this is the first 3D printing project that we worked on six years ago called the 3D printed bionic ear. And the way that this works is that we have our printer, and then into the printer we feed three different types of inks, the ones that I just described to you. A cell-based ink, a silicone soft ink, and then a silver particle-based ink. And we feed this into the printer in order to create our bionic ear. So what this printer is doing here is it's printing an ear which is in the exact geometry of someone's actual ear. You can scan their ear, feed that information into the printer, feed that information into the computer, and then send it to the printer in order to create the geometry that exactly replicates someone's ear. Now what we're printing in this particular case are chondrocyte cells in an artificial matrix. So these are the cells that form the basis of the cartilage in your ear. And 90% of the cells survive this printing process. So we're printing these cells out, and after the printing process, which takes about an hour, we then culture these cells in a Petri dish. They excrete their own matrix, which replaces the artificial matrix, in order to create something that's sort of like artificial cartilage uh, in a Petri dish, in the exact shape of someone's ear. Now, the only thing about this is that these cells, they can't hear. They can't listen to music. So we need to introduce functionality as well. And this is where we print this silver-based antenna into the ear on the same platform. So now we're printing not just the cells, we're also printing an antenna into the ear, so now the ear can actually receive music. And that's why we call it our 3D printed bionic ear. So in this video you see a left ear and a right ear that we've 3D printed listening to Beethoven. So these are actual cartilage cells with an antenna built into the ear, all 3D printed on the same platform, where the ears can actually listen to music. And the beautiful thing about this is that this may not just be used to restore hearing in someone who's lost it, but you can tune that antenna to receive high frequency signals. So now maybe you can give someone the ability to hear into the high frequency range, let's say what dogs can hear and humans ordinarily can't. So after we completed this project, 3D printed bionic ears, my mom, who is blind in one eye, came to me and said, well, if you can 3D print bionic ears, then you can also 3D print a bionic eye. And I said, sure. <laughs> <laughs> now, in order to do this, this is, a, this is a more recent project and more sophisticated than the ears that I just showed. Because the way that your eye works is you have cells in your retina which take incoming light or photons convert it to electrical signals, which then go to the brain. Your brain processes everything electrically. So you need to be able to replicate that process of optical to electrical on using a device, which is in the shape of the curved shape of, of an eye. And that's exactly what we're doing here. What we're 3D printing now is not something simple like an antenna like you saw before, but these are actually sophisticated semiconducting based devices called photodiodes, which receive incoming light convert it to electrical signals, and eventually when we implant these devices, whether it's the eye or the ear, they would have to be implanted into the brain in order to receive these signals. We're not there yet, but that's the next step. And so what you see is that not only are we printing, fully 3D printing these semiconducting based devices, which has never been done before, our group was the first to do it, we're doing it directly on a curved surface that's in the shape of an eye. So you think of all of your electronics, it's all two-dimensional, it's all flat, whether it's your smartphone, your iPad, your laptop. This is a curved structure where we're directly 3D printing electronics 
in the shape of an eye. And each of those dots that, that you see there is a pixel which can receive light and convert it to electrical signals. So this is our 3D printed bionic eye. And this is the eye visualizing a cross that we projected on it. And you can see it can actually see that cross on this hemispherical geometry here. Now let's go back to our original problem that we posed, which is, can we tattoo your next smartwatch directly on the skin? So we have to think this through a little bit. Why is this a challenge? We already mentioned some of the challenges, but let's discuss this in more detail. Now, one thing is that, let's say we want to 3D print a device directly on your hand. Now, the 3D printer, as you saw, it's a nozzle, extruding material. So it sort of may remind you of a tattoo parlor where they're basically using a needle to inject ink under the skin. You're basically tattooing inks. In our case, the inks are functional. Now, the thing is, your hand, let's say, is a contoured surface. It's a non-flat surface. It has topology to it. And you need to be able to have that syringe adjust to the topology of your hand so it doesn't break the skin. That's the first thing. The second thing is, when you put your hand under the printer, it's impossible to keep your hand perfectly still. Your natural reaction when this robotic needle is coming toward you <laughs> is to want to pull your hand away. So you have to mount cameras on the printer that can track the motion of your hand so that you can't escape. <laughs> so those are the challenges that we had to overcome in this project. And believe it or not, I have an amazing student in my group who was able to do that. So that's what you see in this video here. So this is his hand under the printer. And the first step here is that we're actually placing an LED on the back of his hand. Now what we're doing is we're placing tracking markers on his hand, which will track the motion of his hand using cameras mounted on the printer. And now we're 3D scanning the hand so we know the topology of the hand so we can compensate for that while we're writing the electronics. And now we're directly tattooing a silver-based conductive ink directly on his hand. Now notice he's moving his hand while this printing process is happening. And it's not a periodic predictive motion. It's a random motion. It's random in translation. It's random in rotation. And the printer is compensating for this in real time in a closed loop fashion in order to directly print this antenna connected to the LED directly on the back of his hand. Now, you may think this is some big complicated printer that we used to do this. In fact, this was a $300 printer, which weighs about two pounds. And so you can imagine that it's just this lightweight printer you can put in your backpack, and that you could be a soldier out in the middle of nowhere, take this printer out of your backpack, and print a solar panel on your wrist, or print a chemical or biological warfare sensor on your wrist to protect you from the enemy. And now since we printed this antenna on the back of his hand, this, will, this allows us to wirelessly power the LED that we placed in the first step. What this 3D printer is, is a democratization of manufacturing. It's a democratization of biomedical devices. It's a democratization of the electronics industry. And so I ask you, what would you do if you owned your own 3D, printing, uh, 3D printer that could print functional materials? Would you print your own biomedical device? Would you print your own bionic organ? Or would you tattoo your next smartwatch directly on the skin? <laughs> Thanks a lot.